needs to be amplified just a little bit because we know that we all need the Lord. But also the Lord says that the world needs you also. And this is the goal of the Gideons International is the idea of sharing the gospel with the entire world. That is our purpose in serving him as Gideons. Last year, the International Gideons uh, passed out 93 million copies of God's Word. We're striving to, by 2020, to pass out and deliver to people 100 million copies of God's Word. We can't do that by ourselves. We need the help of the churches. Most of the money that we receive as Gideons come from churches just like this and churches across the nation. The uh, purpose of, of all this, of course, is that we might win souls for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Since 1908, the Gideons have distributed 1.8 billion copies of God's word. The Gideons also not only pass out scriptures individually, but we, we have what we call blitz. We do that here in the United States. We've done it in New York City. We go to foreign countries, to some of these large countries, and we may pass out 200,000, maybe even 400,000 copies of God's word to just one city. This is done over about a, a two-week uh, span of time with Gideons who have come from many nations to uh, take part in the Blitz. You know, as we pass out scriptures, uh, we receive them in big boxes. 
You know, those boxes have a way of becoming empty. That's true. We'd run out of Bibles. There's many people who are standing in line to receive a copy of God's Word. Those hands go empty. They do not receive a copy because they're all gone. So even though we have passed out 400,000 copies, there are still people because there isn't enough Bibles to deliver to them. The Gideon International does not go in debt to buy Bibles. If we don't have the money to buy them, we don't buy them and we also don't deliver them. You, there has uh, been a song that's written. Uh, it, it deals with uh, our world, actually. There's millions of people who are destined to go through life struggling, not knowing what they were doing, not knowing who controls their lives. Uh, sometimes they are seeking and they are seeking for someone to tell them of our Savior. The lyrics of this song speaks to this. <laughs> Empty hands that reach for someone who can help them in their flight, who can tell them of salvation, who can point them to the light. Empty hands, empty hands do I see, do I see. Empty hearts that long for something that will satisfy their soul. Bring them peace and satisfaction, cleanse their sins and make them whole. Empty lives that have no meaning, searching vainly for a goal. Life to them is but a treadmill with no purpose in their soul. We must, let me repeat that, we must tell them of the Savior, who their emptiness can fill and can satisfy their longing and their deepest needs fulfill. Empty hands, empty hearts, empty lives do I see, do I see. Opportunities abound in these foreign countries in delivering the copies of God's word with 200 uh, uh, countries being involved with uh, Gideons and having camps. The men in their own camps delivered the Bibles that we as Gideon International furnish the Bibles, but they do the delivering. They put scriptures in those empty hands. What can you do? You can do a whole lot. Prayer is, is so important to us. Prayer that we can receive enough funds to deliver enough Bibles to fill the, the needs of the world. You can uh, also pray that each one of these New Testaments or Bibles will result in a salvation as they are given out. What can you do today? I want you to give. You know that. The preacher has explained that you're taking up money, that this is a, a, not only a, a worldwide mission for Central Baptist Church, but it's a, it's a worldwide mission for each one of you as you give and as you have a part in giving to the Gideons International. The new the Bible here, the one you saw on TV, cost $5. And the others, the New Testaments, they, they cost a dollar and 35 cents. I always tell people that, well, you know, you can buy 10 Bibles uh, for $50 or you can buy a whole box of Bibles of 100 and for $135. If you want an idea of, of what we'd like for you to give, you don't always have that much, but uh, whatever the Lord leads you to do is what you need to do. You can also use the Gideon Memorial Bibles. We have a a file in the library, beautiful cards that uh, you can give in memory of uh, death or uh, something like this, thinking of you. There's other cards that are in there. This is the one that's used most. It's free. You can uh, save $5 by <laughs> taking that instead of buying them at the Baptist bookstore. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Anyway, are asking you today to, to give. And uh, I think that I can very personally be, personally say that every penny, every dollar that you give will be used not only to purchase the Bibles, we have to buy them, but also to have them delivered 
and our Gideons in these other countries do most of that. Pastor, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, congregation, I, I'm going to thank you in advance as you uh, uh, take your envelopes that are in the bulletin and are in front of you and be sure you put the name uh, Gideon's on it or if you don't, it'll go to the preacher in the church. So uh, I'm going to ask you if you will, uh, the church is nice enough to give us this day and so they give us all the money that uh, is designated for us. So thank you very much. Good morning and a welcome here to uh, Central. I know a lot of folks just joining us a live streaming, live Facebook by television. So good morning. Glad to have all of you with us. If you got a Bible, uh, let's take and turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, we're going to pick up uh, in verse uh, 16 uh, this morning. Just a word of clarification, the money in the offering plate does not go to the preacher. Okay, I just want you all <laughs> I love Dr. Muse. Dr. Muse is 81 years old. We've been on mission trips together. In fact, he's getting ready to leave uh, here next week. He's going to be doing a medical mission uh, in uh, uh, the Ivory Coast area along with Dr. Panic. So I appreciate him. His uh, zeal for the word and spreading the word of God uh, around the world and the work of Gideons. We've got a lot of Gideons in our church today. Hey, we're in a series called The Movement. It's a short series in the book of Acts. And we've been teaching through the Bible uh, in a year. Next week, we launch into the book of Revelation uh, uh, and we'll finish that up before we do the campus launch, August the 12th, and start kind of a campus-wide series, uh, which is called uh, uh, All In. Today, the passage is the one that deals with Mars Hill. Now, a lot of you had an opportunity to grow up in church. Maybe you heard it before. Some of you haven't. Uh, but if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, let's just be honest with one another this morning. How many of you would probably say, by lifting your hand up, say, okay, I'm a follower of Christ and I've really sensed the leadership of the Holy Spirit maybe to share the good news of Jesus Christ, but I, I really didn't know how to start, where to begin. I didn't know how to, I kind of maybe got a little afraid. Anybody ever like that out here? That means nobody's like that. I'm going to raise my hand for all of you who just lied. Okay, now, now here's the thing about that too. This passage Paul finds himself uh, in the area of the Areopagus, which is there in Athens, which is where the Epicurean philosophers, we're going to read through the passage, and the Stoic philosophers are kind of gatekeepers of the city. Uh, in fact, they were very religious, if we can say that, and they would always be talking during the day and this kind of stuff, but he finds himself in a situation where he begins, I call it kind of common ground, he finds a place to begin, he shares the gospel, and some people get saved. So what I'm praying that will happen today is that this will be an encouragement to you as you have as believers an opportunity to share the gospel. As God's people here at Central Baptist Church, we are a sent church. We are senders. We send out. We are sent to go and make disciples of the world. I'm, amen? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Go and make disciples, baptize them in the, name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's what we call to do. Would you stand with me this morning for the uh, public reading of Scripture? We're going to read through this in its entirety, and then we'll come back very quickly and move through this passage this morning. Verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic, Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. And some were saying, what would this idol babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be proclaiming a uh, proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him to the Arapagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears so we want to know what these things mean. Now the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So Paul stood in the midst of the Arapagus and said, men of Athens, 
I observe that you are very religious in all respects, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription, To an Unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all the things that are in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Uh, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation." So if they would seek God, perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent." Because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst. But some men joined him and believed. Among them also were Dionysus, an Arapagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for today. Thank you for this, the, the spreading of the Word of God uh, through the Gideons. Father, I pray you'll bless their ministry, use them uh, here locally and around the world and uh, introducing people to you. Father, I pray you speak to us today. Holy Spirit, have your way with us today. Uh, Lord, I pray you will encourage folks. I pray you disciple us, Lord. Uh, I pray you grow us in our relationship with you. And then, Lord, too, I know here uh, out in Refuge and by television, live streaming, there's some folks who do not have that personal relationship with you. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that through the preaching of the gospel today that somebody uh, will repent of their sin and put their faith and trust in you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Excuse me, the name of Christ and all God's people said, amen, amen. Please be seated if you would. Thank you for standing for the uh, public reading of the Word of God. You know, I I talked through this message a couple years ago. I was looking back uh, through the notes in this, so it may be just a little familiar with you, but there are three aspects that we're going to work through this passage with this morning. First, we're going to look at uh, Paul's motivation. You know, his motivation is sharing the gospel. Then we're going to look at the message, which is very simple. It's a gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was preaching Jesus uh, and the resurrection. And then we're going to look at his method, how he does that, how he works uh, through that as he stands before uh, those folks. So let's first look at uh, his motivation. When you see there in the very beginning of the verse 16, it says, Paul was waiting for them at Athens. His spirit was provoked within him. Now, if you go back up and read in the chapter right before that, uh, you will see where Paul and his buddies have got run out of two different communities for the preaching of the gospel. And so basically, Paul is there in Athens and he's waiting on them to come to meet him. But as he's looking around and observing, uh, the Bible tells us he's provoked in the spirit. You see, Athens was the uh, intellectual center of that day. It was also the idolatry center uh, of that day. So there were all kinds of shrines and all kinds of altars and false worship and stuff. So much I've already read through it, but so much that they have an altar that says to the unknown God. They were so afraid of offending a God and that Athenian culture that they just put an altar out there and said to the unknown God. So people would go by and they would worship this altar, worship that altar, and they'd come to this one that said the unknown God and say, look, I don't know who you are. I've never heard of you, but just in case you're out there and we don't know you, I'm going to give praise to you also, okay? It was just they were very religious if you said that. And by the way, when you tell so I would never personally tell somebody I'm a religious person because when you say religion, you can be a Hindu and be religious. You can be a Muslim and be religious. Someone asked me, aren't you telling me about your background, this kind of stuff? I would say I'm a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Come on. So when you use that word religion, remember it can mean a lot of things because, in fact, he says, I see that you gathered here are very religious to some degree. they got all these false idols and false worship that's around. But he was burdened on the inside. He was provoked. When he looked around at Solus, he saw the lostness of the city. Now, when you look at people, what do you see? I want you to think about that. When you look at people, what do you see? We all, all of us in your line of work, I would almost say almost all of us, I guess, you come in contact with people. When you come across people, what, what do you see in the lives of folks? I mean, how do you view them? Do you have a burden for the, the souls of men and women, uh, girls and boys? Paul was burdened by this. Paul, I, I think it's very simple. He had never gotten over being saved. 
You know, Paul would say that to die uh, is, is to go to be with Christ. It's game, but to stay uh, may be better for the folks he's working with. Paul was ready to go be with the Lord Jesus Christ. He never got over being saved. He never got over what happened uh, on that road to Damascus. And I would say today in the life of the church, sometimes what happens in the life of a believer is you kind of maybe just get over uh, being saved. When we get in the book of Revelation, we're gonna, we'll, we'll do a teaching series on heaven. Heaven is a place, hey, there's no crying, there's no tears, there's no cancer. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Isn't that good? Hey, there's no mosquitoes. Woo, isn't that exciting? No mosquitoes. I know it cannot be 120 degrees and humidity so high you can't breathe. It's not going to be like heaven. It's going to be perfect. For all you beach people, there are no oceans when you get to heaven. You'll be okay, though. You will love it. There's rivers and stuff like this. I mean, it is beautiful. We've all got our own dwelling place. Don't you like that? The Bible is very clear that there's no marriage or giving a marriage in heaven. Angie does not disagree with the Bible. She just does not like that very much. I said, well, baby, think about it. You're going to get a mansion. And I know the Lord's good. He will put your dwelling place right by mine. She said, you know what? I'm not living in mine. I'm living with you and yours. So we'll just have an extra space. Now, y'all will catch that later, right? Okay. It is wonderful. This is where we're going to be one day in all eternity. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, nobody can take your name out of the Lamb's book of life. Nobody can do that, okay? The Lord says, he who I hold in my hand, nobody can snatch him out. This is where we're going. It's perfect. It's better than anything you can imagine. Uh, we are redeemed on the inside here on this earth. We still live in these fleshly bodies, but we're going to have a brand new body one day. No aches, no pains, no hurt. It's going to be so good. That's where we're going, but right now we are still right here. Now, even here, this is where we're going, but even here, we can have peace in the midst of the storm. Uh, we can have peace in the midst of difficulties, of the cancer, the death, the loss of life, uh, relationship issues. We can have peace through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ here. Now, this is where we're going. This is where we are now. Why waste the next few years we have on this earth? Why waste them? Now, do we enjoy the things that God has given us on this earth? If you have kids or grandkids or children or puppy dogs, whatever you like. I mean, you know, your work and, and hopefully I, I hope you like what you get to do uh, in life. Uh, that's good. But there's going to come a day this is all over with here and we're going to be there. For Paul, Paul knew he was going to be in heaven the Lord Jesus. He'd never got over being saved. He understood the love of God. He would say, well, I'm in Athens. I'm not going to waste my time. I'm looking around here and I'm seeing all this and he sees the lostness of the people. So when you look at people, what do you see? When you look around the world, what do you see? The video we watched of the Gideons, hey, the lady who was in the hotel room about to have an affair on her husband and through God's word, God intervened and stopped her. That's an everyday occurrence. When you see the businessman uh, that's there in the hotel room and he, he's drinking the whiskey and water or whiskey and Coke or whatever it is and he's throwing the papers everywhere and he opens up TV changer and finds the Bible. That's an everyday occurrence that's going on. God has put us in a circle of people out here. And I just want to encourage you, man, if you don't have that heart and that burden for people, ask the Lord God Almighty to give it to you. You know, and it could be that you have uh, gotten over being saved. We get all excited about heaven. Amen. I do. I, I'm ready. But never forget where God brought you from. Never forget the muck and the mire that he saved you out. Don't wallow in it because it's been forgiven, but just realize it's by his grace. The Bible's very clear. When they came to the Lord Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord God, heart, mind, soul, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two hang all the law of the prophets. Upon these two. Love God, love others. Have you lost your motivation and your desire? to see people come to Christ? And the answer to that is yes. We've got to say, well, why? Why is Have you gotten over being saved? Man? And so we have the invitation, and it's coming, and it'll be in a few minutes. Maybe you just need to pray and say, Lord, just restore to me that desire. Maybe God has put upon your heart, maybe this is a short-term uh, mission trip. Maybe that, and you may say, well, man, Arch, if I go on a mission trip, I, I'm not going to know what to do. I'm not going to know what to say. Or even if I, I speak with one of my friends or neighbors, I, I don't know. It's about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That has never changed. So Paul, he has this motivation, but also he has this message. Now, the Bible picks up in verse 17, says he's reason, reasoning in a synagogue uh, with the Jews, but it's also in the marketplace with the Gentiles. And then here's the thing about it. The Epicurean scholars and the Stoic scholars, or excuse me, philosophers, basically say this guy is an idle babbler. Now, we don't run around today calling people idle babblers, but you need to understand this culture, that is not a good terminology. It's not a good word for someone to call you this. Basically, the... Uh, 
Epicureans were hedonists, which is hedonism, which is the desire of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. So you got to picture this. They were like, eat, drink, be merry, for you may die tomorrow. When you die, you just get buried in a hole and your life's over with. That, there are people out there who believe that today in our culture. So they're all about the pleasures of life, the pleasures of the flesh, all this kind of stuff. It's hedonism. It, Satan's uh, scheme is still alive and well today. That's the Epicureans. But the Stoic philosophers, they were like the New Agers of the day. They believed God is everywhere. God is in everything. In fact, they would say that God is in you. So therefore, you got to get in connection with the divine nature, which is in you. So therefore, you're basically a God in of yourself. So they weren't about pleasure. They were just about connecting with your divine nature. So you had opposite ends of the spectrum. So when they bring Paul before them, you got to picture, picture this, the Epicurean philosophers who were involved in hedonism, desire of the flesh, they'd been out all night, probably involved in immorality and all kinds of stuff. They're sitting there thinking they are better than anybody else and better than Apostle Paul. The Stoic philosophers who believe, basically, that they are a God in of their self, they think they're better than anybody else. And so they're sitting there and they're referring to Paul as an idol babbler, a guy who was a Pharisee of Pharisees, a tribe of Benjamin, bilingual in languages, I believe one of the smartest men uh, in the New Testament. Uh, we have a lot of theology that God gave him uh, to give to us in the pinning of uh, different epistles and letters that we have in the New Testament. So a very smart man. So they were looking down on him. So you may think, Apostle Paul didn't jump up and say, well, this is who I am and this is where I come from. He was just probably grinning and bearing it, but it says he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now, do you realize that when you begin to talk about Jesus, people are going to call you names. They're going to say stuff about you. Uh, they're going to say uh, you're weak-minded or you need a crutch or you don't know this and you don't know that and all this kind of stuff. You just kind of grin and bear it, but you, the, the message does not change. It's about Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. Amen? And so what we have here is we have the motivation. Okay, so have you lost your motivation? Uh, to see people come to Christ? Or have you lost that zeal? Have you gotten over being saved? Do you realize the opportunity we have here uh, on this earth at this time and this place right now? This is where we're going. This is where we are now. Let's don't waste any time in the middle. Man, let God just stir your heart, give you a burden for people. Realize that the message has not changed. It's about Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. This is a supernatural message. When uh. Whenever I go, like I'll probably be in Uganda in September again. And so there'll be the wooden, I love it. It's like a wooden platform. And we'll be doing a medical clinic and an animal clinic. And people are going to come. And then we're going to get to stand up and preach the gospel. This is exciting uh, about this when this happens. Because here's what you're going to see. It's a supernatural move of God when you're preaching. This is not just some book that somebody went on vacation, stuck their toes in the sand, and just wrote. You know, and it's on the number one best-selling list. This is the inspired word of God, alive and active, that changes the lives and hearts and minds of people that gives folks direction and focus and puts people on mission. This is God's word that he's given us. So when you stand, the good news of this, it's not about the messenger, it's about the message. And when you stand and you begin to talk about Jesus, Jesus Christ, the name which is above all names, there is no other name under heaven whereby men may be saved but by the name of Jesus. And when you talk about, hey, he died on the cross for our sins. He shed his blood uh, for us on the cross. They placed him in a tomb and the grave could not hold him. And three days later, he came out. I mean, that is the gospel powerful message. And it stirs the hearts and minds of people. He was preaching Jesus and his resurrection. So motivation, method, or excuse me, motivation, message, and then his method. Now, this is a great, I believe, picture of evangelism where Paul kind of just begins right where they are. So he has looked around. He has found all the idols. He's provoked. He's burdened for them. Uh, they bring him before the mass of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers. Uh, he's there before them. They say, we want to hear what this babbler has to say. And he says, I can see that you're very religious. <laughs> now, you can imagine they're sitting there and all in their robes and feeling good about themselves. He says, I can see you're very religious. Like, yes, yes, we are. Yes, we are. So he kind of met them where they were. And he says, I even found this altar to the unknown God. That's the craziest thing to me that they would do that. And so he finds this unknown God. He says, this unknown God that you don't know, I'm about to proclaim to you. He starts right there. 
And he talks about the Father in heaven who is the creator of all things, of how he created uh, everybody, that through Adam, uh, all the people have been passed, you know, have come down through Adam. So he talks about that. He talks about how he's the Lord of heaven. He's sovereign. He is in control. He is a sustainer that he gives breath and life uh, to all people. So, so he's creator, he's ruler, uh, he's sustainer, uh, he's Lord of all things. But then he also goes into the point, he says, but it's at this place that, that God has overlooked this times of ignorance. And he says, he's declaring that everybody should repent. And then he comes right to that preaching point about the Lord Jesus. He says, through one man, okay, one man. And he says, he's given proof of this because of the resurrection from the dead. Now, their response on Mars Hill, the Bible tells us that uh, they sneered in him. They laughed. Now, here's what I know, okay. I'm looking at the clock. It's 8 till 12, if you want to know. Every time I do, everybody looks down at their watch to see if I'm lying. It's a preacher thing. It's okay. That's all right. I do the same thing when I'm sitting out there. But here's what I know. For some people today, here, refuge, live streaming, live face. I know, I know I'm talking fast. I know. I'm just wired that way. But it's gone in one ear and out the other. I get it. It's just the way it is. You say, are you offended? No. Did we hurt your feelings, Archie? You going to cry like a little baby? No. I'm not. You know, when I'm on a mission field preaching on that wooden platform, there's people sitting out there on the ground. I can say stuff, and I'll look at them, and then the translator will speak it, and I can see people just roll their eyes at me. Do you realize that when you share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? I've never gotten over being saved. That's one thing. It, I've never gotten over being saved. I am amazed by his grace and his mercy that he would save me. When we preach the gospel, do people sneer? Yes. That's the way it is. But that does not deter us from preaching gospel. There are probably some of you here who are born-again believers right now. There was a time in your life you sneered at the gospel. Hey, there was a time in I would not roll my eyes at the preacher in church, but I just kind of take it or leave it one ear out the other. So the response was they sneered. There were others who were very curious. You know, even on the mission field when you're preaching in another language and you don't know the language and they don't know English, but the translator is working through all that, you can tell those who are interested in the gospel. They're curious. They want to know. They're not at that point of repentance, not at that place of salvation, but they're interested. So the response, it says, we want to hear more about this. We see that anywhere we go. There are some people that you're around, they're going to laugh, they're going to sneer at you, but there's some people around here very curious about the story that you have to share with them. You see, the Bible tells us that within this earthen vessel, we have a precious treasure of the gospel, a life-changing message of what God can do for anyone who will come to him in repentance and faith. So there are some who are very curious, but it also tells us that there were some who believed. Now, as we come to this place of invitation, okay, there's some of you here who need, and you know this, this is the, you sense this separation from the Lord God Almighty. We talk about Jesus and his blood that was shed and his resurrection uh, from the dead and all these things. There's something within you saying, my life is not right. I'm not right with God. You may even be saying right now, I am far from God. Honestly, in relation to how the, the Holy Spirit is working in your life, it is good that you're realizing that you're far from God. Now, the positive thing of this is that you can come to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and in faith, and he'll save you today. The preacher does not save anybody. The deacons don't save anybody. Small group leaders don't save anybody. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who brings conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who saves. And the Lord Jesus says, if you call upon him, he'll save you. It's not some fire insurance policy. It's not just some magical words you pray. It's the desire of your heart to say, Lord Jesus, you're right I'm wrong. Lord Jesus, you're the Savior. I'm a sinner. Uh, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're raised from the dead on the third day. Uh, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I've lived in this muck and mire and all this stuff, and I turn away from that. And Lord Jesus, I turn to you. If you come to him in faith and come in repentance, he will save you. When we get this invitation, there's some of you who just need to repent. You say, Lord Jesus. I mean, the message of repent, you cannot get saved unless you come to him in repentance and in faith. And so some of you may just need to repent and say, Lord Jesus, now I messed up. I got stuff in my life. Lord Jesus, I want you in my life. I want you to save me today. And he'll save you, not based upon my word, but based upon his word. Okay? So that's the invitation for some today. There's some of you here, you just need to pray. Man, you just need to come and pray. Maybe a prayer of thanksgiving, or maybe you just need to come and pray and say, Lord, I've lost that, I've lost that desire 
to see people come to know you. Maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit spoke to you today and you may say, I feel like I've been wasting my life. And I don't want to waste any more years in my life. How many more years are you going to give me on this earth? Because he, we just read, our habitations and our times are appointed by God. And so maybe you just want to say, I don't want to waste my life, Lord. So maybe just a prayer where you say, Lord, use me, however it may be. Use me right where I am in the, in the sphere of influence I have, in the circle of friends. Use me right here, Lord, to have an influence upon you. Maybe you just need someone to pray for you. Maybe you're going through a difficult situation uh, in life. Maybe there, we all have issues as believers in Christ. We all have issues, stuff that's happening. So maybe you just need to pray. Maybe you need a, a lady to pray for a lady, a man to pray for a man, whatever. So maybe you're under spiritual attack in the last service. Some good friends of mine uh, didn't know this was going on uh, in their life, and they, and they came during the invitation and said, man, I'm just under spiritual attack. And they began to share with me that story. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that was going on. But thank you uh, that we're able to pray for you. So maybe this morning you just need to come and allow someone to pray over you. Do not waste this invitation. We're going to be out here in about 10 minutes or so. Do not waste this time this morning here out in Refuge or live streaming, wherever you may be. Man, let God do that work in your life this morning. Respond to him in the way that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart now to respond. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray this morning. And Lord Jesus, uh, you are the Lord. You are the living God. There is no one but you. And so, Lord, we look to you this morning. We call upon you this morning. Uh, Lord, there's some here who need encouragement, some who need strengthening. Lord, this morning, Holy Spirit, uh, there's some here maybe facing spiritual battles, spiritual warfare. And so, Lord, uh, I pray that uh, we would have an opportunity to pray for one another this morning, uh, an opportunity to praise you and to give thanks to you. But, Lord, also there are some who need to be saved here out in refuge, some who, who need to come to you in repentance, uh, who need to come to you in faith, uh, calling upon you this morning. And so, Lord, I pray uh, that they would hear uh, and answer that calling, uh, Lord Jesus, upon their life and that they would surrender completely everything uh, over to you. It's in your name we pray, uh, the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Can we stand to our feet?